everyone. Uh, welcome to this presentation from the Center for Global Media and Communication. Uh, I'm Dr. Dina Matar and I am the uh, cha chair of the center. And I also convene the uh, MA Global Media and Communication on campus and the MA Global Media and Communication uh, and Digital Cultures on uh, distance learning. Uh, but I'm going just to talk uh, briefly about what we, we could expect to do at SOAS and basically uh, what we try and teach. And I'm going to talk about the topic of um, the media and crisis. So uh, I need to share my presentation. If you could hold on and uh, yeah. So what what do we mean? And um, you know, sort of. So this is an example of what you might be taught and so on. Um, so basically, the problem of media and crisis, and what is the problem? Are we talking about media and crisis? Are we talking about crisis of the media? Are we talking of, about crisis of communication? What are we talking about? So the question is, how do we understand crisis? Whether we can understand it just by looking at the different theoretical approaches coming from uh, other disciplines to understand what we mean by crisis and what role uh, can can a critical media and cultural studies uh, program help you understand crisis so what can we do how can we use media and uh, critical cultural studies to understand crisis and the way that it is produced and consumed via the media so the um, Secondly, you know, in this talk, I will be uh, talking about critical approaches to addressing media and crisis coming from uh, critical media and communication studies and political communication studies, which I uh, kind of um, research and uh, have worked on for quite a while. And then, you know, what are the contemporary debates around media and crisis? Why does it matter to think about this topic? So you see this image. This is the image of uh, at Black Light Matters held by, uh, you know, a, a black man, obviously, and trying to think of what it means. So what does an image mean? What does the language mean? What is the context behind this image? Why is it so uh, meaningful in a sense? So. Part of what we do is try to understand the language that media use to uh, communicate ideas, to communicate concerns, and so on. In this sense, the hashtag at Black Lives Matter is a hashtag of the social movement Black Lives Matter. And what does it mean for people who receive it? How, how is it shared? And so on. So what does the image mean and what does the language mean are key concerns when we think about questions of crisis. And of course, uh, the the um, racism at the moment uh, is a a, a a crisis. It's it's one of the key contemporary debates that we are talking about in our everyday lives and in our understanding um, uh, of how we can uh, address it. But the question is, what crisis? What we're not only talking about racism. What crisis is there? And obviously, having. Uh, for all of us living through the pandemic, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we are in a situation where the only way we know we are in crisis is whether we are experiencing it ourselves in our location, wherever we are, or whether we know about it via the media. And I think, you know, inadvertently, we know about the crisis because the media tell us we are in crisis. And because that is everything that we know about the world is, is via the media. So we receive news, we receive uh, reports about crisis elsewhere via the media. What does that mean? So in a sense, in other words, we cannot, we come with a kind of hypothesis or the thesis that we try and explain uh, by using uh, critical approaches for media and cultural studies and looking at uh, case studies. Uh, around the use and the, and the consumption of media is that we cannot understand crisis without considering how crises are communicated and in which language, what are the images used to communicate crisis, what are the words that are used to talk about crisis, etc. In relation to that question, we need to think of another question that's related not only to the language and the image, but the question of what 
are the drivers uh, behind media coverage? What drives the choices behind media co coverage? And it's really important, particularly in the digital age, because in the past, what normally uh, drove uh, media coverage was the sense of something happening elsewhere, something unexpected, a crisis happening elsewhere uh, that, that is unexpected, and that is often seen as being negative. So, for example, crisis of, uh, you know, kind of migration in relation to conflict and, and the ways that uh, it is talked about as being a negative uh, issue and as being unexpected. And there's also this, uh, the drivers of news media coverage and what decides, who, what is decided on the news agenda is sometimes also um, considered through the lens that some catastrophes are more important than others. And we see that happening today in the coverage of the COVID-19 crisis, particularly because of the focus on uh, the now and uh, the, 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 the now and the here. So in a sense, we're focusing at a temporal moment, which is the time of the crisis, but we're also co concerned about the here, which is the crisis happening in our backyard. So we neglect what is happening elsewhere. And these are issues that we discuss uh, in, um, in uh, critical media and communication studies at SOAS, particularly in relation to the invisibility of uh, what is going on elsewhere other than the Western world, particularly in Western media. So what can uh, the production and the creation of media coming from non-Western context tell us about crisis elsewhere? And the other question that we ask is who is the intended recipient? Who is the author uh, of uh, you know, the, the, the media and crisis, the reports about crisis? So who are the audiences? Who are we trying to reach out to? And um, again, the question of who's, who is the author? Who is writing uh, that, that report? And this question is really a question that brings to our um, attention uh, question of access. Who has the right to communicate? Who has the right to speak? Who has the right to narrate? Who has the right to circulate a story and images, etc., uh, etc.? Et and of course, we doesn't mean that we neglect uh, the, the 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 phenomena that is, uh, you know, a, a really important phenomena in, in the in the contemporary world, which is the rise of uh, user-generated media. So we're not only relying on mainstream media and the media that reaches so many, we are also looking at other media that is produced by ordinary people uh, and in, in different contexts. Again, how is the crisis imagined? We look into the terms that the media use to designate major misfortunes. What's in a name? Because it matters. If you're kind of using a negative language to talk about a crisis, then you are somehow um, not really directing, but somehow making your audiences think about something in a particular way. Um, and this matters particularly if, if that language is used um, repeatedly because it can become normalized, that is, it can become accepted. So for example, when we talk about the crisis of migration. What is the language that we, we use to talk about migrants? Do we use the word migrant? Do we use the word refugee? Uh, do you use the word exile? Uh, do, do, we, do we kind of uh, frame those words in a context that brings up um, questions of violence or bring up questions of uh, you know, economic resources and the fact that we have to share uh, resources with others. So it does matter. Language does matter. And, and the terms and the imagination of the crisis does matter. And of course, when you're talking about your crisis or the crisis that's happening within a national con uh, context, it, how does how, do you use the same terms as you are talking about crises that are happening in uh, other contexts? So when we had news reporting of the famines in Africa um, in the 1990s, what you know, it was far away. What what did that? What were the associated meanings 
around that? What did they evolve and involve? And why does it matter? It matters because media are implicated and are part of power structures in society. And we need to think of and try and unpack and critically engage with this question of power. With this said, we do not simply assume or take for granted that media are powerful. Well, they are powerful, but we want to understand how that power works, whether it's shifting, whether the fact that we have more uh, digital uh, platforms, does that mean that power is shifting from the, the, the elites to the people, or is it not? Who is controlling what? And this becomes an important question uh, when we think of uh, the new, you know, the rising uh, digital platforms that have become huge media companies in their own right. But of course, we're not only focusing on the Netflixes or the Googles or the Facebooks of the West, Western world. We're also looking at what is being produced in other parts of the world. So the internet, uh, the Chinese internet, how does it work uh, in relation to uh, neighboring countries? What is it used for? But crucially, what we come up with is this underlying uh, idea that all crises are socially and politically mediated practices. And this is where the question of mediation, which is a key term in media and communication studies, makes us think about the relationship between the production and the consumption of uh, media uh, texts, media images, um, and so on and so forth. So of course, crisis is an analytical con context. It's an, an analytical concept that we need to think about so to go back and just to make uh, make it very clear that media studies has like other social sciences originated in in western contexts it's originated out of a history of uh, studies um, and theorization in the western world and as such it is very much um, blighted if i could use that word by western centric approaches and what we try and do at SOAS is to think about it from a non-Western centric approach. And this way of thinking does not mean that we are just theorizing without thinking of actual practices and lived experiences in the in uh, coming out from the non-Western world, but we are engaging with these theorizations and critiquing them at the same time by looking at what is uh, taking place in other parts of the world and trying to make sense of them. But the idea of crisis as an analytical concept, again, it's a concept that is very much uh, emerges from a Western-centric genealogical view of progress and modernization. So crisis in many ways um, and in much of the literature, and I, I, you know, I must admit that you know, the old literature uh, it talks about crisis as happening elsewhere. It happens in those countries, in the third world. It happens in those countries that have not yet developed, that have not yet developed the political systems, the cultural practices to the same level as the Western world. And, and this is where we come from. And we critique this approach to modernization by looking at the genealogy of crisis. But of course, COVID-19 has taught us that actually the crisis also happens in the West. And it, you know, it, it isn't like the West is uh, modernized or uh, developed to a, you know, a, a, a new uh, level of modernity. That means it is exempt or it, is, it does not have the same problems as other parts of the world. And even moving out of COVID-19, we can think about the climate change crisis. That's a very important crisis that is really challenging uh, our uh, ways of living and thinking and behaving and is going to challenge us even more. And again, if we think about the crisis around race or around uh, continuous violence against women or around other, um, other practices that differentiate along ethnic or religious lines. So what does it all mean 
do we still, can we still take for granted the approaches that say, well, only when societies reach modernization and democratization, then they can, um, you know, the possibilities of crisis happening will be reduced. So what we try and understand is that the analysis of terms and the analysis of concepts and thinking about concepts as analytical terms make us think about their emergence and their use. And we then begin to contest and critique how such words can lead to norm a normalizing or a normalizing a universal way of seeing and explaining the world. But the world is not uh, universal. There are different experiences. There are different histories. And so we need to look into that. And by looking at, um, at how media uh, kind of engages with these different experiences and by how people from the regions that we are uh, researching and studying, how people are producing media, films, uh, artwork, uh, you know, uh, material on digital platform, how through their production and looking at what they are producing and why and for which reason they are producing that, we can learn and we can understand more about uh, the role of media in these societies. So to go on. But of course, crisis is not only about, you know, thinking about crisis as being a condition, a lived condition. We are, can think of crisis in the media or crisis in information or information crisis. Remember in 2016, Trump used the term fake news to talk about any, um, any uh, media or any report that was uh, speaking or was, was uh, opposed to his views. And of course, he waged a continuous battle against the mainstream media and calling them fake news. And we have uh, examples of that in uh, uh, late 2020 and the storming of the Capitol in Washington. And then we also have this uh, populist rhetoric against mainstream media is also in other parts of the world. We have Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, Narendra Modi in India, Nabil Karwai in Tunisia. And what does that mean? What response do governments have uh, to deal with, with uh, you know, to deal with populist rhetoric? And so in a sense, we have uh, countries like Egypt passing new laws against four news that are likely, according to uh, their uh, regulations, to harm, quote unquote, national interest. Who can define the national interest? Why is it important to have new laws to regulate the media in authoritarian countries? How does regulation work? And again, we have the academic debate around misinformation, which is something uh, you know we will be uh, working on uh, during uh, in in you know during your uh, study, if you decide to come to study at SOAS, we we offer we offer different modules, uh, thinking about anti-media populist versus anti-populist media. What is the relationship between populism and media? What is anti-populism? You know how do we define populism in relation to media? And of course, we, we think about the, the problem of the crisis of mis misinformation as also being a crisis around the declining uh, uh, credibility of the mainstream media and the ways that even you know, more and more uh, youth and young people are actually moving towards either creating their own media platforms and sharing uh, information uh, around their own interests and what they want to see happening in their own context, moving away from mainstream media. The term mainstream media means the media that is supposedly reaching the largest part of the population. Like the BBC here in the UK, Al Jazeera is almost a mainstream media because it reaches across uh, nations. And of course, the crisis information comes against a, this 
this phenomena of a decline of interest in centralized information channels and official media outlets. Because people are migrating away from what we often have called in the context of the Global South state media, state-run media. And again, it's also a context of polarization, audience fragmentation and filter bubbles and echo chambers. What is happening here? How does that affect uh, questions of, uh, you know, kind of national identities or the question of community cohesion and so on? Uh, what does it mean when the audience is fragmented and what type of crisis does that uh, produce? So we might have a crisis in terms of uh, the, the emergence and the emergence and the proliferation it's a very important uh, problem currently around uh, hate speech and extreme speech, which is uh, problematic. But at the same time, the crisis around journalism and around the authenticity of journalism, but at the same time, we have uh, also the, the crisis around safety and, um, and ethical issues uh, related to journalism and journalistic uh, practices. So these are issues that we work on in our classes, and these are important questions that we want to ask, but we, we try and approach phenomena to explain the phenomena. We do not come with, uh, you know, kind of trying to say X causes uh, or, or X causes Y. Question of causality is very difficult to answer because, you know, things during crisis in particular, we find that um, behaviors can be, uh, cannot be um, completely uh, decided a priori before we do the research, before we understand what's going on. So what we are interested in is looking at the phenomena, at contemporary phenomena, but that does not mean we are not looking at the history as well, histories of media production, we're looking at media environments in, in the context of the global south. We're looking at comparative approaches because we think that comparison can help us move beyond the biases of universal um, arguments and, and trying to think of the world as being the same, but also uh, as being different. So we look at the phenomena to explain what is going on and why it is happening at this moment, but we cannot predict uh, the, the result or the outcome of what is happening today in the future. And the example of the Arab Spring is a very good example of that, because the Arab Spring is again a crisis. Uh, it is a crisis in trust, a crisis of politics, a crisis around participation, a crisis around, um, you know, kind of people feeling marginalized and so the uh, the use of social media in that particular context context has been has been debated but the early kind of uh, projections that well this is going to lead to democratization did not happen and so it it is just to explain phenomena and media is so important in trying to explain phenomena. Before I go into uh, talking about our own research, uh, I want to say uh, something around. Uh, I want to say something around uh, the general approach that we take in our uh, modules, which is, you know, open discussions, trying to understand phenomena, trying to think of what can the study of critical media and communication uh, contribute towards other disciplines, towards the discipline of politics, towards the discipline of anthropology, towards the discipline of history and law. How can we, um, how can this understanding help in uh, these disciplines? In other words, media studies is importantly an interdisciplinary um, field of study. So our research, we have been working on political communication in non-Western contexts, 
um, this is uh, an area of research that I am very interested in. So political communication means looking at the relationship between politics and communication and trying to understand how um, communication is used by both um, you know, um, regime or state actors or political actors or political elites and by uh, ordinary people and trying to think of media as a space within which um, to struggle over politics, over communities, over uh, belonging, over identities, over gender, over race takes place. So this is, you know, in, in many ways uh, informs a lot of uh, my research and the research of my PhD students. And we also are looking into understanding uh, production and consumption from a non-Western perspective. We look into informal and grassroots digital activism in the global south. How can that help us understand uh, and, and think about new ways of exploring informal and grassroots digital activism, exploring how it can be used to inform policy, for example, uh, in the global south, gender and the media, uh, representations and cultural politics, because representations matter. Who is represented? What are representations about? What do they signify? What do they mean? How can we understand them? And of course, diasporas and transnational communities. It's a very important part of the research that we do, where we look into the, the ways in which diasporas and transnational communities are challenging or and continuing to challenge the national uh, perspective, the kind of, the, you know, the, the bounded geographies of a nation. And finally, news media and practices. But that's not all um, that we do. And I'm very happy to, um, you know, kind of give you an idea when uh, later on. Now, for uh, questions, my email is dm27 at soas.ac.uk. Um, our programs, we have three MA programs. We have the MA Global Media and Communication and the MA Media in Development. These are programs that are um, that are offered on campus. Global Media and Communication, which I convene, looks into three, you know, is, is quite uh, broad and specific at the same time. We, we look into uh, the political economy of media, asking and answering the questions of who owns the media because it matters, the question of ownership matters. Um, and then uh, the second part, we look into the political communication, the relationship between politics and communication, thinking about media and the nation, media and the imagined, imaginaries of the nation, etc. And the third part is around, uh, you know, cultural studies, questions of representation, uh, cultural and social identities, transnational communities, religion and media. Uh, and so on. Media and development takes a critical view of the discourses of development and looks into um, how media has been uh, instrumentalized by NGOs and so on to, um, to kind of construct an image of uh, the Global South in a particular way. And we offer a critique of that, but we also offer um, a, 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 you know, a, a kind of an understanding of how we could use uh, media for uh, development uh, purposes. And we also have the MA uh, Global Media and Digital Cultures that we offer distance learning and it runs along similar lines as the uh, on-campus degree, but it's, it's a, a two-year two degree and it is allows those students who uh, are working or perhaps cannot come to the UK to uh, study on campus allows them the possibility of the possibility of studying remotely, and we have uh, you know kind of a brilliant uh, group of people whose work uh, has been really very excellent and impressive. Our students are come from various countries, and uh, that is the exciting thing about it because it really means that uh, the classroom, even in the context of teaching uh, online via Zoom or via other platforms, 
means that we are learning about different experiences and about uh, different experiences of using and consuming media. And we learn as well about um, how to address and accept difference because not everyone is the same. So it's a perfect example. Uh, the classroom at OS is a perfect example of this, I, you know, a, a contestation or a, a critique of universal arguments um, about the world and about how we see the world. So I hope this has given you an idea of how, uh, how we uh, teach. And I'm really um, grateful for you for listening and looking forward to receiving uh, your questions. Thank you so much.